So Fred, you do mathematical models. Mm -hmm. What's a mathematical model? What's a mathematical model? Um, a mathematical model is just a, system, a way of describing what you think is going on in a system using an equation, right? It could be one plus one equals two. So you drink a Coca-Cola and your glucose level goes up, your glucose and level. your insulin level goes up, and then your glucose level goes down. Right. And does, a that, does that fit into a mathematical model? A mathematical model? model would be a description of the rate at which your glucose level goes up, the rate at which your glucose level uh, stimulates insulin secretion, the way at which insulin secretion now diminishes your glucose level. So you basically have one equation for each of these different things in the yeah. system? Yeah, so a mathematical model would be a whole bunch of equations that each describe the, the way in which one part of the system depends on another part so of the system. So some of my early research was bringing a snake into a laboratory when some people were frightened of snakes. We cured them very nicely. They were mm -hmm. very grateful. Mm -hmm. They got very, very frightened. And we measured their cortisol levels and their growth mm -hmm. hormone levels and their mm -hmm. adrenaline levels every couple of minutes for an hour mm -hmm. or so in the midst of this. And it was my job as a junior scientist to figure out how all of these endocrine changes related to each other. And I looked at that data for a few months and I gave up because it, it, everybody had a different response. Is that um, what we should have expected? Um, you might have expected that, and that is because it, that would have come from incomplete knowledge of the system, because right. you, you did not have enough perturbations, or you, didn't, or you did not look necessarily at the right kinds of things. So this is why a mathematical model in many ways allows you to do things that you can't do with the kind of data set that yeah. I had. So the first thing that, that you do with a mathematical model is, is to describe your hypothesis about how you think a system works. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is the, the biggest use of a mathematical model is, to, is that you have to be very hard-nosed about what, how you th who is in the model, what processes are in, are in the, the model, which ones are not, and how they operate. So how many different things will usually go in? Is it three or ten or a hundred? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as many, uh, very simple models you can do with two or three uh, processes. But and, I'm guessing even with two or three, it. you get levels of complexity that are very hard to comprehend. Particularly uh, because the relationship between A and B, for instance, are, isn't simply additive. You know, so you, you say it's nonlinear, and that means what? It's, it's nonlinear. So it means that um, C, for instance, if A and B cause C, right? Um, so if you double your glucose level, you don't necessarily double your insulin level? Correct. So okay. because B, you could be A divided by B causes C. Yeah. And now the question then becomes, okay, so I increase A. Uh, the amount of C that I get will depend very much on how much B I actually have. Okay. So you actually get data from other mm -hmm. scientists working in the laboratory mm -hmm. about how all these things are actually related to each mm -hmm. other and you plug in those values to your models, is we, that right? We plug in those values and write the equations for it. And very often, uh, as you were alluding to earlier, uh, we very often have dozens of equations. So what's model. your favorite model of all? My favorite model? My favorite model is one we've been working on for a very long time, and it's called one carbon metabolism. One carbon doesn't sound very sexy. It's, it's, one carbon sounds kind of boring, actually. Yeah, uh, Lonely. How, how, much, how much metabolism can one carbon have, <laughs> so to speak? Uh, it turns out one carbon metabolism is just a, a shorthand for a very complex system that uh, shuffles single carbon units around in a cell uh, that attaches them to simple organic molecules to make more complex organic molecules. So it sounds kind of technical, but I'm guessing there are big clinical connections. What the, diseases there, are related to this? Um, quite a few diseases. Uh, so one of the critical reactions in one carbon metabolism is the making of one of the nucleotides of DNA, uh, you know, thymidine. It's adding a carbon to a molecule called uracil to make thymidine. Thymidine is the T of the ATCG so code. So if that doesn't work so well. If that doesn't work so well, you cannot replicate your DNA. DNA cannot and replicate. Th and then what happens? Uh, cells can grow. You can, cells cannot divide. And, and Organisms then what can grow. Uh, if this happens during early embryonic development, for instance, you can get very severe birth defects, like, uh, spina bifida. like spina bifida or anencephaly, where the brain doesn't develop correctly, simply because cells cannot divide rapidly enough. So they can't divide fast enough for the two parts of the neural tube to come together and seal. Precisely. And as I understand it, that problem has gotten a lot less common now because of a public health policy. It has in, in about 1989, uh, the U.S. government instituted a mandatory fortification 
of our diet uh, with uh, folic acid. Folic mainly acid, bread, right? Or? Uh, mostly in bread or, or cereal uh, grain products. Uh, so, so, so they're forcing people to add a chemical to our bread. They're forcing people to add folic acid to it. And folic acid is one of the, the, the carriers of these one carbon. Uh, units. That's in, essential in the for cell. making the system work. It's essential for making the system work. So, so if you don't have enough folic acid, you cannot bring those carbons to bear to the to the DNA rapidly. So, enough. what's this intervention done for rates of spina bifida? Spina bifida, of course, is a, a terrible problem at birth, where the, the spinal cord mm -hmm. is essentially open to the outside. It opens it's to the outside. It's uh, in severe paralyzed. cases, it's fatal. In minor cases, it can be surgically corrected. And it's cleft um, lip. Related to that, cleft palate, cleft, uh, cleft palate is the is a, is the the, the, the least severe the manifestation of that. Uh, the most severe probably is anencephaly, where the where the closure of the the tube that forms the brain simply doesn't doesn't occur, mm -hmm. and the brain fails to develop. Sounds very serious indeed. And so those are those are fatal fatal conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so we're from one carbon metabolism, which seems very abstract, to public health policy, which has done what to levels. So it has decreased the incidence of these neural tube defects, as they're called, spina bifida and encephaly, and encephaly uh, by 20 to 60 percent, depending on the population. That, so it's reduced uh, it only 20 percent, or it's 20 percent of what it used to be? No, it, by 20 percent or by 50 or 60 percent. So it's still a problem? It's still a problem, absolutely. Are there a lot of genetic mm -hmm. variations that might influence which mothers and babies are vulnerable to getting these neural tube defects? Uh, absolutely, it depends on the, many of the, the enzymes in this one carbon metabolism pathway uh, have mutations in them that uh, you or I or your wife might have. Mm -hmm. uh, and those might make you more or less sensitive to a folic acid deficiency, right. for instance. So you could have the same amount of folic acid, but if you're carrying one or two of those mutations, which are really quite common in, in human populations. So do most of us have some mutations in these pathways? Absolutely. I think all of us have them. So I think we should pause and go on in a moment to try to figure out, given all these mutations, how is it possible that anybody's healthy? Mm -hmm.